Welcome to Tanakh Talk. I am your host, William Hall, broadcasting live from Kingsland, Texas, USA, with another episode of a Rabbi Cross Examines the New Testament with Rabbi Michael, the man, Skoback. Welcome back, Rabbi. How are you this beautiful day? Shalom, shalom. Welcome back to me, and it's great to be here with you, William. Thank you. On this eighth day of Hanukkah, for those who are celebrating Today is the final day, the eighth day of Hanukkah, and we're doing the eighth chapter of Revelation. How do you like that? How there is some how synchronicity in the world. <laughs> how conveniently planned. That worked out well. Yes, indeed. How convenient. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, that's that's really cool. Uh, so uh, again, it's, it's always a pleasure having you here. Um, glad to see your happy, smiling face and uh Looking forward to. I know. I noticed what we did. Uh, I, di- I didn't get the the full title, so I kind of I kind of titled this one just because uh, it, it was a really interesting point about. Um, yeah, you know, there's a movie. Called, <laughs> there's a movie called. Uh, it's not called Thanos. It's it's called something else. But Thanos is like this, the, this mean guy at the very end, and his his sole purpose apparently is to destroy a third of all life, right? And so this Revelation chapter 8 talks about, you know, the angels coming, you know, angels of God, each one destroys a third of this and a third of that. And it reminded me of Thanos. Uh, but so I just titled it based on the third of the world being destroyed just because it kind of uh, it seems like a overriding topic. So anyway, that being said, what a, what a pleasant thought. What a pleasant thought. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think one of the titles you, you had was Show Far, Show Good. <laughs> I like right. that too. I like that. That's awesome. All right. So we'll, I'll. Uh, we'll, we'll keep that as, as part of the oral Torah. And... <laughs> <laughs> I like it. I like it a lot. All right. Well, I'll turn this over to you and let you do your thing. Thank you, Rabbi. Okay. So uh, I wanted to just share a few introductory thoughts to this chapter, but it's also really um, sort of introductory meditation. Again, a reflection on this book of Revelation uh, in general. You know, there have been many ways of arguing for the existence of God. If you go through philosophical texts, there are many different um, proofs and arguments uh, to show that the existence of an ultimate, all-powerful, omniscient, om, om, omnipotent being is reasonable and it's compelling. So one of the classic philosophical arguments for God is known as the ontological proof, sort of a fancy schmancy name, the ontological proof for the existence of God, and it's usually credited to Saint Anselm who was the Archbishop of Canterbury in the 11th century. And it's actually a subtle argument. It's not sort of uh, straightforward and simple to follow. It's actually a little bit complex and, and, and nuanced, but I can share one very oversimplified way of stating the argument, which is that If you're able to conceive of something, it must exist. If you're able to conceive of something, then it must exist. So if, for example, you can conceive of a being greater than everything else in existence, such a being must exist. That's more or less the thrust of his argument, although obviously It's a much deeper and longer presentation. And what this theory argues is that you couldn't really conceive of something. You couldn't even imagine it in your mind if it didn't exist. And so if it, if you're able to conceive of it, then it must exist. And what this theory argues is that when you have Uh, For example, I'll just try to give an illustration. Imagine if you have a bizarre dream that has incredibly unusual creatures in the dream. So minimally, minimally, what we would know is that the components of this kind of a dream must exist. 
or you couldn't have imagined it in the first place. Let me illustrate. Imagine that a person has a dream about being attacked by an alligator and the alligator has the head of a elephant, of an elephant, and the fingers of the alligator look like bananas. So it's bizarre, it's strange, it's like unbelievably weird, but the person wouldn't be able to dream that unless they had already seen in real life alligators and elephants and bananas. Meaning that you can't conceive in your mind of something that doesn't exist. And therefore, since we can conceive, we can imagine an ultimate being that we refer to as God, then God must exist. And this is what we see, I believe, um, behind a lot of the visions in the book of Revelation. I'm sharing this thought basically as an introduction to what I wanted to say, that um, there are often in the book of Revelation, very bizarre images, very bizarre images. But the reality is, is that they already exist. They're drawn from a palette of images that already exist because they're found in the Hebrew scriptures. And this is something that we'll see, for example, Throughout the book of Revelation, we're going to see it in this chapter. And when you go through these chapters in the book of Revelation, all the images seem very familiar because they are. They have already occurred. You've already seen them in the Tanakh. So, for example, what are some of the images we're going to see in this chapter, chapter 8? So we're going to see the mention of scrolls, the mention of heaven and angels, and trumpets, and the temple altar, and the golden altar, and the censer, and incense, and saints, and the throne of God, and thunder, and lightning, and earthquakes, and hail, and fire, and blood. Obviously, these are drawing on the, the, the ten plagues in Egypt. And then there's a destruction of the thirds, and then there's a sea turning to blood, and stars falling from heaven, and the sun and the moon and heavenly constellations smitten and darkened, and wormwood. These are all words and images that already appear and occurred in the Tanakh. So over and over again, what we see in the book of Revelation are images and personalities and symbols that are basically copied and pasted, or at least inspired from the books of the Tanakh, and they make appearances here in the book of Revelation. So I think it's important when we're going through this book, just to keep that in mind, that without the Tanakh, I think it's impossible to imagine that there would have been a book like this. Now in verse two, um, the text says that I saw the seven angels who stand before God and seven trumpets were given to them. Now, I've gone through a lot of different Christian translations uh, here, and virtually all of them, actually all of the ones that I looked at, translate this as seven trumpets that were given to these angels. But if you go to David Stern's Jewish New Testament commentary, and, and this shouldn't surprise anyone, he insists that these are not trumpets. He insists that these should be shofars. They should be referred to as a shofar because he says, this is his argument. He says that in the Tanakh, in the Hebrew Bible, the end times prophecies of the Tanakh basically speak about the sounding of the shofar. So for example, in the book of Zechariah, Zechariah chapter nine, verses 14 to 16, Again, it's speaking about some traumatic experiences in the end times, times of judgment. It speaks about the sounding of the shofar. And you see the same kind of imagery about the sounding of the shofar in Isaiah chapter 27, verse 13, and in the prophet Zephaniah, Zephaniah chapter 1, verse 16. So what David Stern argues is because 
there's this image already of the sounding of a shofar before the end times, during times of judgment and destruction. So he says that these uh, angels are not going to be blowing sh- trumpets. What would be more appropriate, he says, is that they'd be blowing shofars. But again, virtually every single Christian commentary that I've seen translates this as seven trumpets. Now, what's interesting is that in the Tanakh, in the Hebrew scriptures, these are very, very different instruments, so to speak. So you'll see, for example, the shofar comes up frequently in the Torah. You see it, for example, at Mount Sinai in Exodus chapter 19, verse 16, that there's a sounding of the shofar at the revelation of the Torah at Mount Sinai. And then you see at the uh, coming of the Yovel, the Jubilee year, the 50th year in the cycle of years, we see this in Leviticus chapter 25, verses 9 and 10. Also, it's signaled by the blowing of a shofar. We know, of course, that the shofar, which is, again, usually an animal horn, ram's horn. So the shofar is sounded uh, for the holiday of Rosh Hashanah, the Jewish New Year. You see this in Leviticus chapter 23, verse 24, and Numbers chapter 29, verse 1. And then we have another instance where the shofar is blown, the ham, the, the ram's horn is blown when the people of Israel are conquering the city of Jericho in the beginning of the book of Joshua, chapter 6, verse 4. Um, so you have all these instances where there's a shofar that's blown. Again, it's an animal horn, the horn of an animal, whereas the trumpets don't occur naturally. They're constructed. Um, You see, for example, in Numbers chapter 10, verse 2, Moses is commanded to make two silver trumpets. Those are called in Hebrew chatzotzrot, chatzotzrot, very different word than a shofar. And basically the, the chatzotzrot were used in the Torah primarily to signal when they should break camp and when they should assemble the camp. We know that for 40 years, the Israelite camp was on the move. And so the silver trumpets were blown basically to let people know when to pick up and when to set camp. Um, What's interesting is that sometimes these instruments appear side by side in the Tanakh. So for example, in Psalm 98 verse six, the verse there speaks about bechatzotzrot v'kol shofar, with trumpets and the sound of a shofar. And in First Chronicles, chapter fifteen, verse twenty-eight, divrei uh, hayamim, it's reversed. There it says bechol shofar u bechatzotzrot, with the sound of the shofar and with these trumpets. Um, so there are obviously two different. Uh, instruments that are being spoken of here and as well the 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 silver trumpets were also blown um this is according to the rabbinic literature we know that it was blown by the priests during the daily tamid offerings there was a daily offering every morning and every late afternoon And the priests would blow the silver trumpet during the offering of these sacrifices. And this silver trumpet, these silver trumpets were blown to signal the arrival of the Shabbat every week and the new moon once a month and for the various festivals that come up once a year. Um, It's interesting that the Talmud in Tractate Shabbat 36a tells us that With the destruction of the temple, the names seem to have gotten confused between the shofar and the chatzotzrot. So the Talmud there says that that which was called trumpet was called shofar in later generations, and that which was called shofar was called trumpet in later generations. So there seems to be some, let's say, lack of clarity about which is which, which name appears uh, for which of these 
uh, instruments, but it's not clear, obviously, what the preferred translation here would be in verse 2. Most of the commentaries that I've seen say that just contextually, um, you know, in, in the times that the book of Revelation was written, it was more likely in that social and cultural context that they were speaking about trumpets being blown rather than chauffeurs being blown, maybe because of what would happen in Imperial Rome, but it's very hard to really know for sure. Now, I wanted to say something else, just a general thought about um, the book of Revelation, um, just really as we get into this chapter. It's really, when you think about it to a great extent, the book of Revelation is a spiritual Rorschach test. You know, you get a Rorschach image and it doesn't really look like anything, but when people describe what it looks like, they're really projecting a lot about who they are and the, their vision, their understanding, their conception of what these Rorschach images are reveals really a lot about who they are, what's going on inside their own minds. So I believe personally that if someone is reading the book of Revelation for the first time, if you can imagine someone had never read it before and they're reading it for the first time and they haven't been primed, this is an important thing to consider. If you read it without having been primed with the interpretation of others, meaning by the time most Christians will study or read the book of Revelation, they probably have heard already um, sermons or classes or um, Bible studies that discuss either particularly or what generally the book of Revelation is about. They've heard probably a lot of interpretation already before they even begin studying it on their own. And I think that if you found such a person that is reading this book for the first time without having been primed by others, they will not be able to make heads or tails out of the text. I mean, I, I, I'm going through this book now. I've studied it many times before, but I'm really trying to grapple now with, you know, how to understand it. And to me, it's, it's basically impenetrable. And indeed, what you'll find is that there are countless Christian interpretations of how to approach the book of Revelation. And because Christianity lacks an official oral Torah, so to speak, there is only speculation about what this book means. So, for example, St. Jerome, who was about the greatest scholar of the early church, he admitted that the book of Revelation has as many mysteries to it as the number of words that it has. It's basically, you know, uh, it's an incredibly, incredibly difficult, complex, mysterious, frustrating uh, book to understand because it's not understandable. It's really not understandable. You have to impose understanding upon it. But on its own terms, the words themselves are not, they don't come forth with a clear meaning. The greatest mystery to me is how it's possible for so many Christians over the centuries to insist that theirs is the only credible interpretation. That I find mind boggling. How does any Christian insist that their interpretation is the only credible one when any interpretation of this book is so rife with speculation and, and, and uh, suppositions and assumptions. Um, I don't see how anyone could be so sure that they have the only correct interpretation. Um, you know, we do know that there is a passage in the book of Luke where, which seems to hint at the fact Christians are told, I believe it's a 20 or 20th or 22nd chapter, that if they're ever questioned by the authorities about their beliefs, they should not worry about what to say because the Holy Spirit will tell them what they should say. 
And so I think there are many Christians who believe that they have the, the correct interpretation because they believe that the Holy Spirit has given them the correct interpretation. The only problem is that the Holy Spirit seems to be providing hundreds and hundreds of people with hundreds and hundreds of different interpretations. So there's very little quality control or consistency, if that's the case, with the Holy Spirit. Um, there have been basically five major schools of thought in history over the, over the centuries in terms of how to approach the book of Revelation. And in some of these approaches, there are many dozens of different interpretations under each of these major approaches. So just to summarize them, it's worth thinking about this. There is what is called the critical view. The critical view of Revelation basically sees the book of Revelation within the cultural and historical um, context of the original readers. So we know it's a product of approximately the first century. And so how would the readers in the first century have understood this text? So the critical view basically sees the book of Revelation generally as a struggle between the emerging church, because don't forget the, the church is basically coming out of its embryonic stage at this point, and the Roman Empire at the end of the first century. And basically this book of Revelation is seen essentially as an attack, as a uh, you know long polemic against the very arrogant, powerful Roman Empire. That's one view of what this book of Revelation is. There's a similar view, which is the preterist view. And this also sees the book of Revelation through the eyes of the original readers in the first century. And they see it as describing not so much a political conflict between the church and the Roman Empire, but they see it as describing the end of the old covenant and the old covenant dispensation, especially of the sacrificial system, because they had just recently seen the destruction of the temple and the ending of the sacrificial services. So to this view, the book of Revelation is describing the end of the old covenant and the beginning of the so-called new covenant. And Christianity is seen in this book, therefore, as the fulfillment, in a sense, of the Old Testament hopes. And Revelation describes, therefore, the start of the final phase of salvation history, meaning that they see history that originally is traced through the Hebrew Bible, through what they call the Old Testament, and they see the Old Covenant was one that God had given to the Jewish people that centered on, uh, now, this is not the central point of Judaism, but this is the way the church has seen it, that the central point of the Old Testament was its sacrificial services in the Holy Temple, but that's been done away with, according to this view, and it's been replaced by the new system of salvation and inaugurated by the new covenant, which is salvation through the death of the Messiah, etc. And the book basically now uh, kicks off, if you will, the beginning of the final phase of salvation history. The third approach to this book of Revelation is called the historicist view. And this sees Revelation not as something that's sort of rooted in the first century, but it sees the book of Revelation as painting a panoramic view of the church throughout history. It's really sort of pan history, and it's tracing the different stages of what the church went through and is going through and will be going through throughout its history. Um, it shows the basically the different stages of church history on a very large scale. Then the fourth view is what is often called the idealist view, which really sees the book of Revelation as using symbols to portray the ongoing struggles in the spiritual inner life of a Christian. So the wars, for example, the battles and the wars 
in the book of Revelation really represent the conflicts in the inner life of a Christian. So there, this is taking the book out of the realm of history, and it really is seeing it as representing and sort of a, a symbolic of really the inner spiritual life, the inner spiritual world of a Christian. And the final major school of thought on the book of Revelation is called the futurist view. And this sees the book of Revelation as a preview of the end of history and the future. It speaks about the future return of Jesus and the destruction of evil, the final judgment and how it will all play out. So they see the book of Revelation as a book of prophecy that is telling us exactly what's going to happen in the end of days for the church, and it describes events that are yet to happen, that are yet to happen. It's not speaking about what was going on in the first century. According to this view, it's describing what is going to be happening in the end times. And this particular view of the book of Revelation is obviously the most popular of the five schools of thought among today's evangelical Christians. And what's amazing is that um, among evangelical Christians, you have literally dozens and dozens of different ways of understanding and interpreting how history is going to unfold in the end of days. There isn't one uniform way that the so-called prophecies here in the book of Revelation that describe what's going to happen in the future are understood. And, and what you see among some Christians is a, an attempt to try and blend and integrate these five different approaches. That's obviously the most complex way of dealing with the book. Now, the second half of this chapter of chapter eight describes tremendous destruction. And this has really been going on already uh, in, in previous chapters of Revelation. Revelation has already described the havoc from the opening of the seven seals. That was one of the first major symbolic images in the book of Revelation, the seven seals, the seven sealed scrolls. And the unsealing of these scrolls basically symbolizes and, and really speaks about tremendous destruction that takes place. Our text in chapter eight describes some of the destruction that's unleashed by the trumpets or again, according to David Stern, the chauffeurs and this destruction that is described in chapter eight here is greater. It's a worse destruction than the judgments of the opening of the seals and the greatest devastation, however, is yet to come. And we're going to see that in future chapters that describe the seven bowls, the seven bowls, the judgments of the seven bowls, that is going to be even a greater kind of devastation. So the devastation and the destruction in the last part of this chapter, mainly verses seven to 12, um, seems to describe, or it seems to really borrow from, or at least to be inspired by, um, the destruction of two thirds of those in the land from the prophet Zechariah, Zechariah in his book, chapter 13, verses eight to nine. So here in Revelation eight, what you describe are different destructions of one third of this and one third of that. It's basically a destruction in thirds. And this is very much the imagery in the prophet Zechariah, where again, only one third will survive and two thirds will be lost. Um, and there are several ways in which this passage in Zechariah is understood. It seems that the minority view is that it's describing the destruction that will take place before the coming of the Messiah, where two thirds of those in the land of Israel will be destroyed. One third will survive. That seems to be the minority view. It seems that the majority view 
is that it's not describing a destruction that's limited strictly to the land of Israel. It's describing more of a global destruction where, again, two thirds of the world will be lost, destroyed um, in some way prior to the coming of the Messiah. Again, I want to reiterate something we've mentioned several times before, which is that negative prophecy, any prophecy that's negative, that's destructive in the Tanakh is contingent and it doesn't have to transpire as it is literally described. And we see this from the book of Jonah. We know that in the book of Jonah, chapter three, verse four, he says that in 40 days, the city of Nineveh will be overturned. Now that seems to be a pretty dire prophecy. And yet we know that at the end of chapter three in verse 10, God does not destroy the city. He basically pardons everyone. What's the reason? Because everyone has repented. They've take, they've really, they, they've rejected their evil ways and they've turned back to God. And so it seems as if this prophecy did not come true, but the reality is it did come true. You just have to understand that you can interpret the word overturned in a more flexible way, meaning that if the people turn themselves over, then the city will not be physically overturned. But either way, one of these things is going to happen. So the people will either not repent, in which case the city will be physically overturned, which means destroyed, or the people will turn themselves over, they'll repent, in which case the city will not have to be physically destroyed. And so this is a principle that we understand throughout the Tanakh, that any negative prophecy, any prophecy of doom and gloom is essentially a warning. And the warning can be averted if people do the right thing. And then in verse 10, we see an image of a great star falling from heaven in the book of Revelation here in chapter eight. And this is, again, either inspired or borrowed from the prophet Isaiah, chapter 14, verse 12. There, Isaiah says, um, how you have fallen from the heavens, O glowing morning star. You've been cut down to the ground, O conqueror of nations. That's one translation, O conqueror of nations. Another translation is, you have been cut down to the ground, you who would cast lots upon the nations, meaning that, uh, that the fallen star here would cast lots, determining which nation he would conquer next. That's why I think the first translation is a little bit easier. You have been cut down to the ground, O conqueror of nations. And this is referring to, obviously, the Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar, and when the prophet Isaiah here describes him as a bright light of the morning, it's sarcastic. He's no bright light of the morning, but that's a sarcastic put down of king of the, the Babylonian king, Nebuchadnezzar. So this seems to be, again, uh, be, be sort of the imagery behind the imagery in Revelation chapter eight. And uh, believe it or not, William, that's all I had to share on this chapter. Well, it did seem to be a little shorthanded. Um, so <laughs> so you, <laughs> you did. Well, well, it's a short chapter. It, it is. And, yep. and as I said, I don't understand a thing about it. Um, but those are the those are the thoughts that I did have. Well, that was thoughtful enough. That's all I know. Well, thank you, Rabbi. Uh, once again, your time is always precious to us all here and very grateful for your work. And uh, I had a thought while you were um, while you were doing your your show today uh, I was thinking you know you don't have I mean you've got like a, you've written pamphlets and things to, to pass out right but I think what would be an amazing book series is using this set of shows that we've got how many shows like 80 I don't know how many shows we've, we've got to combine 150 I don't know but you know you could literally convert the content of these videos into your first book like just do the gospels for example or you know and just do the work of paul or whatever you know individual individual things that's something to consider 
because the Here, here's the, here's the the good news for the Jews <laughs> is that this would not be my first book because I have about five books that I'm working on. Oh, really? Oh, uh, that's excellent. Yeah, this this kind of a project will have to wait until I retire. <laughs> gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Um, maybe one day. Well, the good news is I, it's there waiting for you, so the content's already there. You just gotta it, just gotta it, gather God it. And... Grant, if God grants me a lot of time and a lot of years. Nice. Uh, this may be you know one of those projects I hope to finish. That's really cool. That's really cool. All right, guys. Well, thank you all for tuning in. I uh, had a great time being with you as well, and uh, we'll look forward to seeing you next week, uh, same time, same place, as Shim willing. So take care, everybody. We'll see you next week. God bless. Take, God bless. Take care, everybody. Bye. Shalom, my dear friends. Hope this message finds you well. If you like the way this channel is going and the channel has been a blessing to you, please consider supporting the channel by going to the website, tanakhtalk.com, T-A-N-A-C-H-T-A-L-K.com. Thank you once again for your time and for supporting Tanakh Talk. Shalom.